Well, thank you, Vitislav, for the introduction. Dobry den, good afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to visit uh, Czech Technical University for the first time, as well as the uh, Institute for uh, Advanced Photovoltaics. Photonic crystals are widely known for their light trapping capabilities. However, this wave interference based light trapping has not been fully exploited in the field of uh, photovoltaics, especially in the case of uh, silicon solar cells. Uh, silicon, as you know, has an indirect electronic band gap. And so typical silicon cells are relatively thick in order to absorb enough light. And this leads to a lot of recombinative losses. And as a result, over the past two decades, the efficiency of crystalline silicon solar cells has only increased slightly from about 25 to slightly over 26%. And what I'd like to present in my talk today is that uh, with photonic crystals, there are two uh, key advantages that one uh, can apply to silicon. One is that uh, it may be possible to increase the efficiency to over 30%, and at the same time make the thickness of these silicon solar cells a factor of 20 or more less than traditional solar cells. So just by uh, way of introduction, let me um, start. Uh, according to the uh, US Department of Energy, uh, the Earth continuously receives more than 10,000 times the amount of uh, energy than the total uh, energy use in the world. This corresponds to about 173,000 terawatts of solar energy. In the upper atmosphere, that corresponds to about 1.37 kilowatts per square meter. And on the uh, surface of the Earth on a clear day at sea level, that's about one kilowatt per square meter. And here I just illustrate a little bit about a conventional solar cell, which uh, typically has some junction between N and P type regions. Uh, the idea is to absorb as many of the photons as possible from the sunlight. Uh, the electron hole pairs that are then created must uh, diffuse to their respective contacts. And the important point is to allow those carriers to reach their contacts before some recombination effect occurs. And it's this balance between absorbing as much sunlight as possible and at the same time allowing the carriers to reach their contacts efficiently that defines uh, what is the best design for a given solar cell. And what I'd like to show you today is that there are some opportunities for absorbing an enormous amount of sunlight in a much thinner region that has been, than has been traditionally believed. As you know, silicon module efficiencies have been growing steadily over uh, the years, and at uh, this time, uh, roughly between uh, 17 and 19 percent, and it's still increasing slowly. Uh, but, I'll, but these are made of relatively thick silicon uh, materials, and I'll show that with thinner silicon, it's actually possible to absorb as much or more light and at the same time reduce these recombination effects. So here are some of the examples of uh, world record setting uh, solar cells. Uh, in crystalline silicon, the efficiency record as of last year was uh, set by Kanika Corporation in Japan at 26.7%. And this is using, again, a relatively thick piece of silicon, 165 microns uh, in thickness. Uh, Multicrystalline uh, silicon has an efficiency record of uh, close to 22.3%. If you go to some of the uh, direct band gap semiconductors, such as gallium arsenide, the record a few years ago was set at 29.1% uh, using only about three microns in thickness. And then there are a variety of other thin films, SIGs, cadmium telluride, uh, perovskites, etc. Uh, despite all these other alternative technologies, silicon still continues to be the, uh, the dominant part of the, uh, the market, occupying uh, close to 95% of the market. And quite a bit of that now is in uh, multi-crystalline silicon. The uh, bottom picture here illustrates what the ultimate thermodynamic efficiency is possible, uh, according to uh, Shockley and Kweiser back in uh, 19, early 1960s. And the chart here just describes how the uh, energy from the sun is distributed into various uh, mechanisms in the solar cell as a function of the band gap of the underlying semiconductor. So if you have a semiconductor with a relatively small gap, then this pink region 
uh, denotes the amount of energy that's just converted into heat as carriers are generated well above the band gap of the semiconductor and on the scale of picoseconds they relax to the uh, conduction band edge. Uh, as the uh, gap of the semiconductor becomes larger, uh, less of that thermalization takes place, but then this blue region indicates uh, light that falls below the band gap of the semiconductor and it simply is not absorbed. And so there's a balance between these two effects and the green region defines the uh, part that is potentially converted into useful electricity. And both uh, silicon and gallium arsenide occur somewhere near the peak of this, uh, this green curve here. And in the case of silicon with an electronic uh, band gap, which is an indirect band gap, uh, 1.12 electron volts, uh, the maximum possible efficiency at about room temperature is uh, 30, slightly less than 33%. That's the shockley quiser limit. 19% uh, falls below the band gap and is not absorbed. And roughly another third of the solar energy is just converted into heat by thermalizing uh, photogenerated carriers. This looks in a little bit more detail at uh, silicon itself. Uh, at the uh, top graph, you see the solar spectrum as it's seen on the surface of the Earth. That's the red curve. Some absorption in the atmosphere corresponds to these dips. And of course, the solar spectrum continues uh, beyond the band gap of silicon. This just happened to got, get blacked out in this uh, conversion to this computer. Uh, on top of this curve, I've superimposed the imaginary part of the dielectric constant of silicon. That's this black curve. And so you can see that silicon is very absorptive at relatively short wavelengths. But as you get to longer wavelengths in the 600, 700 nanometer range, that absorption coefficient is becoming much weaker. And then as you get into the region near the indirect uh, band edge, say between 800 and 1200 nanometers, uh, that is becoming even smaller. If I convert that into an absorption length scale, in the uh, three to 400 nanometer wavelength range, the absorption length is on the scale of 10, cent uh, 10 nanometers or less, and that absorption length steadily goes up, uh, reaching on the order of tens of centimeters as you're in this 1,000 to 1,200 nanometer range. And so this really calls out for a light trapping mechanism to try and harvest uh, as much of this longer wavelength part of the solar spectrum uh, as possible. Light trapping is something that's well known in the uh, photovoltaics uh, technology and industry. Uh, most of it is based on treating light as a ray and using some sort of statistical ray trapping mechanism for trapping these uh, long wavelength uh, rays of light. And this is sometimes associated with a concept known as the Lambertian or 4n squared limit, which I'll explain in a moment. It's not really a limit, it's actually just a benchmark. And the idea is to, uh, rather than have a flat surface, top surface of the, of the solar cell, have some rough surface, which randomly deflects incoming sunlight by a distribution of different angles and the probability distribution of those angles is given by this function. It's proportional to the cosine of the angle theta relative uh, to the normal. And the idea is that if one can deflect that light by a sufficiently large angle, then all light that is deflected by an angle beyond a critical angle for total internal reflection uh, becomes trapped and will have a very long path length within the structure. The uh, Lambertian argument also assumes that this randomly rough surface does not contribute to any specular reflection, that it all uh, comes inside the cell and then escapes or is uh, totally reflected by uh, the simple ray optics mechanism. So the critical angle for total internal reflection, as you know, is given by one over the refractive index, the real part of the refractive index of the underlying material. And so if light bounces off the rear mirror here, and comes back up within a small cone up to this critical angle, then it escapes. If it's outside of that cone, it bounces again and makes another attempt to um, uh, escape. So the probability of escape, that is the uh, number of rays that fall within this small cone, uh, okay, this should have been an integral sign. It's been changed into a box, integral from zero 
up to the critical angle, weighted with respect to this probability distribution, gives an elementary integral uh, which can be evaluated. And the probability escape in this Lambertian argument is equal to just one over the square of the refractive index of the material. Likewise, the average path length for a given bounce is uh, the uh, thickness of the cell L divided by the cosine of the deflection angle times two because it goes to the mirror and comes back up. And that again is an elementary integral which gives four times the, uh, the physical thickness. Now the idea is to make this light undergo multiple bounces within the structure. Let's say it makes M bounces. Uh, we can ask what is the probability that of that occurring. Well, for that to occur in the first m minus 1 attempts, it should not escape, and that comes with the probability 1 minus p. And then, then on the final attempt, the mth attempt, it should escape with the probability p. So this is the probability distribution function of the light undergoing exactly m bounces. And with respect to that distribution, you can calculate what the average number of bounces is that turns out to be exactly 1 over p, or in this case, uh, n squared number of bounces. So the average trapping length or distance that the light would travel by this Lambertian argument is the product of this uh, distance of a single bounce times the average number of bounces. And this gives the famous 4n squared law. Uh, for silicon with a refractive index of over 3.5, this extends the path length by a factor of 50 or more. Now, there is no solar cell that I know of that currently uh, actually reaches even this Lambertian limit, or uh, for that matter, exceeds that limit. But what I'll show you is that with appropriate photonic crystal architectures that make use of the wave nature of light, rather than treating light simply as a ray, it's actually possible to exceed this uh, Lambertian limit. And that has uh, very important uh, implications for the uh, potential efficiency of a silicon solar cell. I got interested in the field of uh, photonic crystals for a purpose that's a little bit different than uh, just uh, in photovoltaics. It was to ask the question, is it possible by analogy with electronics, that is uh, electrons governed by Schrodinger equation, in which electrons can either form bound states or have extended states, would it likewise be possible to create trapped or localized states of light. And if I convert this uh, box into the uh, Laplacian operator that it should be, uh, this is just the wave equation for an electromagnetic wave propagating in a material with a, with a dielectric constant, which has an average part epsilon zero, and a spatially varying part, which I've called epsilon fluctuation. So you can think of this in terms of an analogy with Schrodinger's equation, where this is the potential that might scatter the wave. The difference here is that if the, refract the uh, dielectric constant is everywhere real and positive, that means this epsilon zero is always larger than the maximum excursion of the fluctuating part, so that the effective energy eigenvalue, if you think of this as a Schrodinger-like equation, is always in the positive energy region and above the highest of the potential barriers. And so from this analogy, it would seem very difficult to trap light as you would trap an electron, uh, say, at a negative energy between two classical turning points. And the movie clip that I've been showing you here uh, is a depiction of a solution of Maxwell's equations in a particular photonic crystal architecture in which we create a bound state of light, and we can do it by a mechanism that's very different from total internal reflection. Uh, in that particular case, light was actually being trapped in the low refractive index part of the structure, not in the high uh, index part, as you would have in total internal reflection. Various groups around the world have created a variety of photonic crystals at this point. Uh, this is one that we made uh, about 20 years ago at the University of Toronto, it's referred to as a silicon inverse opal structure. It starts with a template made of glass spheres, uh, an opal template, which is sedimented into a face-centered cubic lattice. And that is then infiltrated by silicon using chemical vapor deposition. And finally, the original silica spheres are etched out by uh, hydro uh, 
hydrofluoric acid etching, uh, leaving behind these shells of silicon, as you see here. The uh, diameter of these spheres is slightly less than a micron, and this creates a, what's known as a complete photonic band gap for electromagnetic wave propagation at a wavelength of about 1.5 microns. So this is just to illustrate the importance and the new consequences of wave interference. This is not a, a good structure for a solar cell, as you can well imagine, because it has so much surface area. And the type of trapping that I'm talking about, light trapping, is different than what I showed you in this extreme case of creating a bound state of light. But one salient feature of photonic crystals is that they allow an alteration of the electromagnetic density of states inside the material. Usually in a homogeneous medium, the electromagnetic density of states, this is the number of modes as a function of frequency, that box should be an omega, uh, would be a smooth parabola, just a quadratic form, whereas in this photonic crystal, due to the multiple scattering of light, you see peaks and dips in the density of states, where the density of states completely vanishes, that's known as a photonic band gap. But there are also regions where the density of states is made very large compared to what would happen in a homogeneous medium. And these high density of states regions are associated with slow group velocity modes of light. And it's these slow light modes which play a very important role in the light trapping that I will talk about for the architectures that I will show you for the uh, solar cell application. So what I would like to show you just as an overview is that wave interference effects uh, associated with the higher bands of a photonic crystal offer a route to unprecedented solar absorption and power conversion efficiency in thin film structures. And by thin film, I mean on the order of 10 microns or less of silicon. And this is associated with this enhancement of the electromagnetic density of states, some new effects in the way light refracts into the structure, which I call parallel to interface refraction, where you can have even normally incident light being deflected nearly transverse to the uh, thickness of the film into these slow light modes, thereby greatly enhancing the electromagnetic path length. And in some of the cases that I'll describe, over 98% of sunlight in the 300 to 1100 nanometer range can be absorbed using only 10 microns of silicon. And this is solar absorption beyond the Lambertian limit. And these thin silicon structures are also flexible. And because they are so thin, it leads to a great reduction in one of the major recombination mechanisms known as Auger recombination losses, uh, which then enable uh, thin, flexible crystalline silicon solar cells to reach power conversion efficiencies over 30%. Uh, compared to the current world record of uh, 26.7 and approaching this uh, thermodynamic limit of uh, 33%, but not quite there. And some of the required thin film photonic crystal structures have already been fabricated either by wet etching or dry etching methods. And some of the optical measurements that I've uh, alluded to have already uh, shown that uh, one can uh, absorb light close to or even above this uh, Lambertian limit. So here I go into a little bit more of the physical basis of how this light trapping occurs within these higher bands of a photonic crystal. This is again just a simple paradigm. Say you have a two-dimensional array of silicon rods and we consider light impinging from the left-hand side at different angles over a range of different frequencies. Then the absorption in this thin region is governed by the nature and the quality factor of the optical resonances uh, inside the structure. By quality factor, I mean the dwell time of light compared to the uh, period of oscillation of the light. The density of these electromagnetic modes or the number of these resonances per unit frequency interval. And finally, the coupling efficiency of light from an external source into these uh, resonator uh, modes. And the structures that I'll show satisfy all these three different criteria. So here you see a typical mode in the higher bands of the structure. Uh, this is uh, frequency versus, uh, uh, versus the, uh, the wave vector of the light going in various directions. 
uh, light in a mode like this, because of its flatness, undergoes a large number of oscillations back and forth. That's referred to as a slow light mode, and that uh, increases the dwell time. There's also an effect known as parallel to interface refraction, where light entering a mode like this, instead of being refracted by a simple Snell's law argument, uh, gets uh, refracted into modes that uh, propagate primarily in a direction that in this graph is going up and down or along the uh, length, the transverse length of the thin film. And that again enhances the uh, dwell time in the structure uh, in, uh, by quite a large amount. And you can go through the exact argument using conservation of energy and momentum of photons entering the film, but I uh, won't go through that. So that's some of the underlying physics law. Let me look at some particular architectures that we're considering in the context of photovoltaics and uh, distinguish them based on the amount of sunlight that they absorb, and in particular what is well known as the maximum achievable photocurrent density. This is an integral over all the wavelengths. This is the AM 1.5 solar spectrum that I showed you on the uh, second or third slide as a function of wavelength. This is the absorption coefficient that we can calculate by solving Maxwell's equations in these structures, either by a finite element or finite difference time domain uh, simulation, and then dividing by the photon energy and multiplying by the current converts that absorption into a photocurrent density. So these are two of the architectures. Uh, the first consists of uh, an array of inverted pyramids uh, the lattice constant here is typically on the scale of the wavelength of light, and I'll show that in one structure the optimum is about two and a half microns. Uh, this is created by a wet etching procedure. It was done uh, by an order I placed to the uh, Melbourne Center for Nanofabrication. So you see a very nice square lattice array of these inverted pyramids by uh, potassium hydroxide etching. If you start with a 100 surface, it exposes the 111 surfaces. Uh, creating this uh, array of uh, inverted pyramids. And the mesa, the flat region here, can be made as small as 20 or 30 nanometers, uh, which is also very important for trapping and absorbing the most amount of light. Another structure that we've looked at uh, was made by my collaborators in the US at uh, Rensselaer Polytechnical Institute. Uh, this is what I call a parabolic pore array again with a lattice parameter of about 1.2 microns. This is made by a dry etching method. And uh, this also shows very strong absorption of light, although the dry etching method probably causes some damage to the surface, which could be very bad in terms of carrier recombination effects. So most of my focus will be on this wet etched structure. So here's some optical data that we obtained for the uh, parabolic pore structures. Uh, looking at the uh, absorption uh, coefficient as a function of wavelength ranging from 300 nanometers, in this case up to 1100 nanometers. Uh, there's a mirror placed underneath a 10 micron thick uh, piece of silicon made out of this uh, parabolic pore photonic crystal. The uh, blue curve is the uh, finite difference time domain simulation showing various optical resonances at long wavelengths. And the red curve is the experimental data, which is, averages over a number of these resonances. And in this case, for a 10 micron structure, which wasn't actually optimized to trap the most light, uh, they observed a maximum achievable photocurrent density of slightly under uh, 40 milliamps per square centimeter. And again, using only a 10 micron structure. Here's a comparison of a, a number of different structures, starting with uh, flat films, which don't have any um, texturing on the top. If you start with a flat, planar 10 micron thick film, that's the green curve, about 40% of the sunlight is being absorbed. That's as a function of angle from normal to oblique incidence. If you go to a 500 micron thick sample with no anti-reflection coating, uh, the absorption goes up maybe slightly over 60%. But if you use a, a 10 micron film with this type of texturing, that's the lower of these red curves. And if you go to a 500 micron thick sample with these, this type of texturing, 
the increase in absorption is only slightly above that. So this is a very good light trapping structure that we've already uh, made some uh, experimental measurements on. So let me come back to the uh, inverted pyramid structures. And you perhaps know that inverted pyramids are, are well-known structures in, in photovoltaics. In fact, going back about 20 years, uh, Martin Green's group used an inverted pyramid structure uh, that is a little bit different than the one that I'm talking about. His structure had a lattice constant, which was about 10 microns. So this was dealing with scales much larger than the optical wavelength. So this is in the ray optics regime. And that's the basis of this uh, initial world record silicon solar cell about 20 years ago, which had an efficiency of slightly over 25%. Um, the total available solar photocurrent in the 300 to 1100 nanometer range is 43.5 milliamps per square centimeter. And we can look at various uh, inverted pyramid structures as a function of their lattice constant, that's this distance A, uh, as well as for different thicknesses, the thickness being denoted by H. So starting with a three micron thick uh, silicon sample, that's the blue curve. The optimum lattice constant is about 1300 nanometers. And when you go to a 10 micron thick sample, uh, it is at 2.5 microns. And here without any uh, anti-reflection coating and with a relatively large MESA D of 100 nanometers, this reaches 40 milliamps per square centimeter, very similar to what I showed for the parabolic pore structure. And this is based on this wave interference light trapping. If you add a uh, anti-reflection coating of about 200 nanometers on top of this structure, as well as minimize this MESA, make it as small as possible, that same photocurrent peak goes up to 42.5 milliamps per square centimeter, approaching the maximum possible absorption based on the amount of sunlight that is available. So here you see some actual optical spectra that we calculated for a variety of different thicknesses starting from three microns up to 10 microns uh, as a function of wavelength from 300 to 1100 nanometers. Um, there's a pretty strong specular reflection at the very short wavelengths here because the refractive index is pretty high for silicon in that wavelength region. But these uh, various peaks show the uh, optical resonance structure of this uh, material. And there's an additional inset here that shows, at least for the 10 micron thick sample, that's the uh, top black curve here, what that absorption would be even in the 1100 to 1200 nanometer range. In an ordinary type of ray optics structure, there would be virtually no absorption that you would get out of this region. But here, you get peaks that are on the order of 50% or so of uh, the uh, total available light. So an additional amount of light uh, can be trapped in this uh, very long wavelength region as well. And finally, if we add uh, the appropriate anti-reflection coating on top of these structures, uh, the uh, photocurrent density goes up from the uh, red curve without the coating to the uh, blue curve. And this is where you see at about uh, 10 microns, it's up to about 42 and a half milliamps per square centimeter. And this is only accounting for the 300 to 1100 nanometer range. This shows you some of the uh, field profiles inside the structure and the nature of some of these uh, individual resonances. So here I've just chosen some examples of a uh, resonance in the three micron thick structure at a wavelength of 1008 nanometers, as well as the 10 micron thick structure at 1040 nanometers, you see optical hotspots in particular regions. So this is high intensity, this is low intensity. The uh, yellow arrows are supposed to represent the pointing vector showing the flow of electromagnetic energy. It's a little bit difficult to see in this picture, but there's a large amount of light that is flowing parallel to the interface. This is an outline of the inverted pyramid at the top. Uh, likewise, over here, there's a large amount of vorticity in the pointing vector field showing that light is circulating around. It's not just going to the bottom and bouncing back up. And this all enhances the lifetime and the path length of the light, uh, enabling uh, absorption at these long wavelengths. 
On the right-hand side, you see the integrated uh, carrier generation profile. This is in uh, units of uh, inverse volume per cubic centimeter um, on a log scale. And you see that uh, this is integrated over all wavelengths of light. You see that a substantial amount of the light is absorbed near the top of the cell and about two orders of magnitude less uh, photocurrent is being generated in the, uh, the lower part of the cell. And it's this information of the photocurrent, photo-generated carrier density that then we have to put into the electronics simulation to determine uh, things like the voltage and the efficiency of the solar cell. So here uh, you see the well-known uh, semiconductor drift diffusion equations, uh, which we have a generation rate, which is a function of position that is from the previous picture that I showed you, and it is obtained by solving Maxwell's equation of the structure that is fed into this set of uh, drift diffusion equations. This is the electrostatic potential. P and N are the hole and electron densities. ND and NA are the donor and acceptor densities, and these are the uh, photocurrent densities, and E is the electric field. Uh, we also include a set of recombination effects into this, uh, which I will detail on the next transparency. And finally, we account for surface recombination, which is a very important feature in uh, determining the efficiency of the solar cell. This appears as a boundary condition uh, in these drift diffusion equations and is described in terms of a surface recombination velocity. So here you see the, uh, some of the most important recombination effects that occur in silicon. Uh, there's uh, a small amount, this is not a very significant uh, part due to the indirect band gap nature of silicon band to band recombination. Uh, the other one is due to defects in the silicon, due to some trapping states, which uh, lead to what is known as the Shockley Reed Hall carrier lifetime. And that is something that uh, we model in this uh, set of drift diffusion equations. And finally, uh, the very important Auger recombination, which is also a function of doping, where uh, an electron drops back to the uh, conduction band instead of emitting light, it excites another electron higher in the conduction band, and that then thermalizes and simply generates heat. So we make use of the uh, recombination models that have been prescribed by uh, this uh, group many years ago in a very famous paper. This is the group at the Fraunhofer Institute in uh, Freiburg, Germany. And they made some estimates on what the maximum possible efficiency of any silicon solar cell could be uh, using uh, the effect of Auger recombination as the limiting factor. And you see that uh, the curves that they generated, this is from their paper, they look at the efficiency as a function of the thickness of the cell. As the cell becomes thicker, more light can be absorbed, but likewise, as the cell becomes thicker, more and more Auger recombination occurs. And they decided or suggested that the trade-off occurs uh, at a thickness of about 110 microns, assuming that the light that was absorbed was governed exactly by the Lambertian limit. And they then said that uh, even ignoring all these other recombination effects, the maximum possible efficiency by virtue of the Lambertian light trapping would be 29 0.4%, and if you can't reach the Lambertian limit, it would be considerably less than that. And what I'd like to suggest is that if you now go beyond the Lambertian limit using these wave interference effects, the optimum thickness of the silicon solar cell is closer to 10 microns, making it flexible as well as thinner, and with a uh, real efficiency, including other loss mechanisms, of close to 30%. The second very important part of uh, modeling the uh, solar cell is the uh, uh, importance of surface recombination. At a surface, of course, you have a lot of bonds that have been uh, broken. They're dangling bonds. These cause uh, uh, defects in which electron hole pairs can recombine. And so typically you passivate the surface by various means. And this is a, a technique that uh, was used by one of my colleagues at the University of Toronto using a, a, a bilayer of intrinsic amorphous hydrogenated silicon about five nanometers thick and then a heavily doped 
uh, region may be 10 to 20 nanometers thick of amorphous uh, hydrogenated silicon followed by uh, uh, transparent conducting oxide. Uh, this combination of effects uh, leads to uh, capping of a number of these uh, dangling bonds by the hydrogen, as well as the creation of a surface field uh, that deflects the minority carriers and prevents them from reaching the surface to recombine. And they were able to show that in terms of what is known as a surface recombination velocity, that's the recombination rate per unit area per unit of carrier density, that, it, that they were able to reach uh, recombination velocities on the order of 10 centimeters per second. So this is a, a parameter that I'll be making use of. And there are a variety of different approaches. Uh, polysilicon is now used very successfully for also creating uh, low surface recombination velocities. So here's the uh, design, at least, of a uh, front surface silicon solar cell. Here you see a pair of front contacts. I put in a, a dielectric structure above that, uh, which is supposed to uh, deflect some of the light around the contacts so that it doesn't cause a shadowing effect. But if there is a shadowing effect, you can reduce the efficiencies that I'll be talking about in this example accordingly. And here, uh, you have a dual layer anti-reflection coating followed by a highly doped N-type region. The bulk is assumed to be P-type silicon. And at the bottom, you see the contact, uh, rear passivation layer, as well as a highly doped P-type region. Uh, this is the doping profile. It goes up to about four times 10 to the 18 per cubic centimeter here and about two times 10 to the 18 in the N side. And with this structure, uh, in the uh, 300 to 1100 nanometer wavelength range, the uh, photo maximum achievable photocurrent density is what I quoted before, 42 and a half. And if you assume a surface recombination velocity at the contacts of 10 centimeters per second, this 10 micron structure has a calculated efficiency of 29.7% uh, at uh, 25 degrees, including uh, the recombination models that uh, were prescribed by uh, the uh, Fraunhofer group. And assuming a uh, Shockley-Reed recombination time scale of about one millisecond. It's also possible to model the absorption of the sunlight in the uh, 1100 to 1200 nanometer range. This is the experimental data shown in uh, the blue triangles and a fit to that using a multiple Lorentz oscillator model. That's our red curve here. And we can also include the effect that is known as band gap narrowing as carriers are generated. The band gap of silicon can be decreased slightly. Uh, the typical behavior associated with band gap narrowing is that the uh, voltage goes down slightly with a potential slight increase in the photocurrent density. And here's a chart uh, describing a few different scenarios, starting with the Lambertian picture, according to the Fraunhofer group, with a cell thickness of 110 microns. And they assume no, no surface recombination whatsoever and an infinite Shockley-Reed-Hall recombination time. And their projected efficiency, uh, the limiting efficiency, was uh, 29.57 without band gap narrowing and 29.43 with band gap narrowing. Uh, and these are the corresponding voltages associated, the open circuit voltages. In our 10 micron thick structure, uh, without band gap narrowing uh, and assuming a surface recombination velocity of 10 centimeters per second, uh, the voltage would be close to 0.8 volts, 42.5 uh, short circuit current, and an efficiency of 29.7%. If we include band gap narrowing, uh, the voltage does drop as expected slightly, but because of this additional absorption with our light trapping uh, mechanism, uh, the photocurrent density increases by slightly over a one milliamp per square centimeter, uh, leading to an efficiency of close to 30% in this cell. And if you have shadowing effects that take out one or two percent, you can reduce that efficiency by that same percentage. Finally, the uh, improved design that I will uh, focus on is this uh, interdigitated back contact cell where you don't have to worry about uh, shadowing 
losses at all. There's no contact on the top surface, but both the N and the P contacts are interdigitated along the uh, back surface. And so here we have a, uh, both the anti-reflection coating layers and a heavily doped P region, which provides the front surface field that deflects minority carriers from the front surface. We don't have to worry about sheet resistance effects as we had in the uh, front contact cell. And we optimize the geometry of these contacts below, as well as the doping profiles uh, that surround the emitter and the base uh, to get the highest uh, efficiency by combined solution of the Maxwell's equations and the drift diffusion equations. And this is something that has uh, just been submitted for uh, publication. And let me start by just talking about how Lambertian light trapping would work in this context of an interdigitated back contact cell with a realistic state-of-the-art uh, surface recombination velocity of, say, 10 centimeters or second per second near the contacts, as well as the state-of-the-art Shockley-Reed-Hall lifetime of 10 milliseconds. That's very high-quality silicon in this case. So the efficiency as a function of the thickness of the cell is depicted here. And in this slightly more realistic uh, scenario, and assuming perfect Lambertian light trapping, the optimum thickness turns out to be about 90 microns. If the uh, light trapping is less than the Lambertian limit, as it is in most realistic solar cells today, such as the Kanika cell, the optimum thickness would be much larger than that. And here the uh, limiting efficiency is slightly over 28%. So if Kanika could reduce all its other losses and improve its absorption up to the Lambertian limit, it would uh, get close to 28% in principle. These are the corresponding voltages as a function of thickness, the uh, photocurrent density, and the fill factor within this purely uh, Lambertian picture. And in our case, where we can exceed the Lambertian limit, uh, the optimum cell thickness is going to be much less than 90 microns, and it's actually considerably less than that. So here are some actual uh, solutions of Maxwell's equation showing the uh, photocurrent density that is achieved uh, as a function of the lattice parameter of the inverted pyramid structure for various thicknesses of the cell ranging from 3 microns up to 15 microns. So the bottom curve is 3 microns, again with an optimum here. At 15 microns, the optimum lattice constant is close to 3 microns rather than uh, the case of 10 microns thickness, which had a 2.5 micron lattice constant. And these are the uh, photocurrent densities for starting with the Lambertian limit uh, for these different thicknesses, ranging from 36 to about 41. This is the maximum achievable photocurrent density only in the 300 to 1100 nanometer range for our inverted pyramid photonic crystal solar cells. And you see this already exceeds the Lambertian limit, which is integrated over the 300 to 1200 nanometer range. So in the case of the 15 micron cell, this is 42.75. And then the additional uh, photocurrent density that can be achieved from the 11 to 1200 nanometer range, uh, you see on the order of an extra uh, milliamp per square centimeter is achieved here. So if you look at the 15 micron thick cell, uh, there's almost four milliamps per square centimeter of photocurrent above this uh, Lambertian limit using this uh, light trapping mechanism. And that has a substantial influence on what the uh, final efficiency of the cell would be. So here again, I show you some pictures of the absorption spectrum in two cases. Uh, the first is a five micron thick cell and the second one is our optimum 15 micron thick cell. The red curve is the Lambertian limit. So you can see these various optical resonances shown in blue uh, take the absorption well above this Lambertian limit in the long wavelength regime. And again, you can see particular field mode, field mode profiles at particular resonances at 1176. This is almost into the Urbach optical absorption ed region, as well as the uh, 1110 nanometer range showing again the vorticity of the pointing vector and the uh, very slow uh, long dwell time of the light inside the structure. So if we put this all together, we can 
calculate what the efficiency of various cells is as a function of the thickness. And I've done this for various different cases of choice of the shockley reed hall lifetime, ranging from 0.1 milliseconds, which would have a lot of defects in it, up to 10 milliseconds, which is sort of the state of the art. So the top blue curve depicts the efficiency of this interdigitated back contact cell as a function of thickness with optimized inverted pyramids. The optimum occurs now at 15 microns, and that efficiency, the theoretical efficiency, is now uh, 31%. If you lower the quality of the silicon, say you go all the way down to 0.1 uh, milliseconds of uh, shockley reed hall lifetime, that's the bottom curve here, the optimum thickness of the cell actually uh, comes down to 7 microns in thickness. And even here, the efficiency is on the order of 27%. So even with polycrystalline silicon, it would be possible to achieve efficiencies on the order of 27% or higher using this uh, light trapping mechanism. And this just gives you some of the parameters associated with uh, the doping profiles as well as the uh, width of the uh, N and P type contacts that uh, occur at the bottom. Uh, these are the uh, voltages for these various different choices of the uh, carrier lifetime as a function of thickness as well as the uh, short circuit current densities. So these are the, the optimum cases. Now let me just finish with one caveat. What if you don't make the cell according to the ideal or optimum prescription that I described here? And as you can see in this picture that I'll show, uh, the surface plays an extremely important role in what the uh, final efficiency of the solar cell is. So here I depict the efficiency as a function of the contact surface recombination velocity ranging from say 10 up to a million centimeters per second for two different cases. The first is in which I have the optimum doping profile, which goes up to four times 10 to the 18 per cubic centimeter. That's the red curve. And then if you're off that optimum, say you have only 10 to the 17 uh, dopants per cubic centimeter, that's the blue curve. So as you can see here, if uh, is the surface is not very passivated and the back surface field is not optimized as well. It's very easy to end up, even with all this light trapping effect, with an efficiency of a cell which is on the order of 5% if the, the surface regions are not treated properly. If, on the other hand, you get at least the doping profiles correctly, then it is a little bit more immune to uh, surface recombination effects. And here, uh, the red curve shows that at least there you can get efficiencies on the order of 20%, even if you don't uh, do everything right on the surface. Uh, so again, uh, optimized dro doping as well as uh, these, the surface recombination effects are, are very, very important in actually determining the final efficiency of the cell. And I've just plotted also the open circuit voltages and the fill factors and the uh, photocurrent densities associated with this, these different choices of the surface recombination velocity here. Okay, so in summary, what I hope I've conveyed is that photonic crystal light trapping enables near perfect solar absorption in relatively thin films, making silicon act in terms of absorption almost like it's a direct band gap semiconductor, even though it actually isn't. And that leads to a major reduction in bulk recombination losses, which are some, one of the limiting factors in reaching efficiencies on the order of 30%. I've tried to describe to you some of the underlying physics, which has to do with wave interference effects rather than simply ray optics, and these new types of refractive effects, which I call parallel to interface refraction, and the slow light modes that are associated with a very enhanced electromagnetic density of states. That's what gives rise to these various optical resonances that tap, trap light. And our projected power conversion efficiency by a fully microscopic solution of Maxwell's equations, as well as the semiconductor drift diffusion equation, suggests that with a 15 micron cell uh, with the interdigitated back contact geometry at one sun uh, and with surface recombination velocities up to 100 centimeters per second, it may be possible to reach up to 31% efficiency, but that this efficiency would drop very rapidly with improper 
uh, front and back surface fields uh, caused by the doping, or you could use maybe some carrier selective contacts, that might be another approach, and or poor surface passivation can make this efficiency drop very rapidly. A final advantage that I didn't mention is that with the photonic crystals, uh, the angular response is very good as well. You don't have to have light just coming at normal incidence. Up to about 50 degrees away from normal incidence, there's very negligible loss in the absorption as well as the efficiency. That might be a, a further advantage of using these type of uh, new architectures with wavelength scale features. So let me stop there and take questions if you have. Okay, the perpendicular light comes in, but you can think of it as a very clever sort of diffraction grating at the top that can deflect light at almost 90 degrees relative to the normal. And then the modes, the electromagnetic modes in the structure are very different from that of a homogeneous medium. There's a lot of vorticity of the electromagnetic pointing vector light bouncing back and forth in the transverse direction that gives rise to the long dwell time. So there's also a small anti-reflection coating on top of the surface, maybe 200 or 100, 150 nanometers thick, that reduces the specular reflection as much as possible. So it's a combination of different effects that leads to the sufficient coupling. Yes, there is a polarization dependence of it. Uh, in some cases, if you go off normal uh, incident, then the, uh, at different polarizations, the absorption can be slightly bigger or slightly smaller, but this is sort of an average value over the different polarizations and over the a small cone of incident angles near the normal. Polarization does, does matter, yes, but it won't change the result very much until you get up to 50 degrees off normal, then you'll really start to see the drop off of the different polarization channels in terms of how much light is absorbed. Yes. Yes, you understand it perfectly. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the crux of what we're doing here. We are making the solar cells much thinner. If you did that with a traditional silicon solar cell, you'd stop absorbing very much light. By making the cell so much thinner and absorbing as much or if not more light, we are reducing the bulk Auger recombination effect. But there's still a certain amount of Auger recombination that'll occur in a 10 micron thick cell because you are doping it and uh, that loss is something that you can't prevent. In thick conventional silicon solar cells, which may be 200 to 300 microns thick, Auger is the limiting factor that will prevent you from ever getting probably above 26, 27% efficiency. By making the cell so thin, that's why we can jump from 26% up to 30 or 31%. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think I had that. Uh, we, we take into account exactly the AM 1.5 spectrum in these uh, uh, calculations, it was way back somewhere. There is. Um, yeah, so here 
you see between 1,000 and uh, 1,200 nanometers. There's uh, actually more peaks and valleys in this that continue. So there's still a fair amount, probably a few milliamps still beyond 1,200 nanometers, but this is the absolute uh, absorption edge of silicon here. So even in the 11 to 1,200 nanometer range, we can pick up an extra milliamp, and there's a little bit more than that in the 1,100 uh, 1,000 to 1,100 nanometer range. So there is light to be absorbed there, and every little bit counts. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. One of the nice things about these photonic crystals is that they are rather robust. And I think one of the pictures that I was showing implies that if I can find it. Okay. So here, uh, let's take the uh, 10 micron thick sample. Uh, and we're looking at the photocurrent density as a function of the lattice parameter here. So you can see that it's relatively flat over this range from say 800 nanometers, it goes up to an absolute peak up to 2,500 nanometers, then it'll start coming down slowly. So there's a broad range of choices of these lattice parameters over which you're gonna get pretty high absorption. That's already an indication of the robustness. Now we could put some artificial randomness on top of this. As long as that randomness doesn't just cause reflection of the light, specular reflection, uh, it'll probably uh, le be within this ballpark. You may lose a little bit, but it won't be very much. Some amount of disorder has even been shown to even slightly increase it, uh, the absorption over and above that of a perfectly periodic structure. So I think that's fairly, that's something that we're fairly confident about the robustness to small amounts of disorder. If it's disorder on the scale of the lattice constant itself, then all bets are off. You're sort of going back to Lambertian type of light trapping. Yeah. Yeah, that's typically what you find. We can, it's a very time consuming simulation to have a truly disordered structure over a large scale. But what we've typically found is that this gives you an indication of the robustness. Thank you. My pleasure.